Okay, so this is exercise eight, the appendicular skeleton. Um, and I kind of misspoke before, your lab exam, your next lab exam won't be next week. Um, I think it's the week after because we still have to get through the muscular system lab. Um, so just keep that in mind. But today we'll just do appendicular skeleton and then I'll give you time to work uh, in that virtual lab. There will be no lab assignment today, um, only working on your own in that virtual lab. So once I'm done lecturing here, uh, you guys are free to go and study the day away. I'm sure you all probably will. Um, but please spend time studying these structures because it's one of the more harder um, subjects. Um, so here we have the pectoral girdle again and the upper extremity that we went over in lecture. Um, so we did kind of go through this already, but the pectoral girdle, we have our clavicle, our scapula, and then in the upper extremity, we have the humerus, the radius and ulna. Again, the radius will always be lateral, closer to the thumb, and the ulna is the medial forearm bone. The carpal bones are your wrist bones. You have eight of them, and you have five metacarpal bones in the palm of your hand, and then you have 14 phalangeal bones in your digits. Here's the pectoral girdle. Uh, the scapula and clavicle are seen here, and everything has been labeled for you um, this is an anterior view of your scapula. So we see your subscapular fossa, the medial and lateral border of it. The lateral border, keep in mind, will always be on the side your humerus comes out of because it'll be further away from the midline. The acromion process is that bump at the end of your spine on your scapula. The coracoid process is another like beak-like structure that different ligaments are connected to to help reinforce your ball and socket joint of the shoulder. You can also see here the greater and lesser tubercle of the humerus that we'll get to. So this is the pectoral girdle and just showing how everything is connected together. The proximal end is connected to the manubrium. And again, the manubrium is the upper part of the sternum, um, which is the top part. You can feel kind of where your manubrium ends and your clavicle begins on your own shoulder blade. Um, there's an inferior angle. That's just the bottom tip of the scapula. What else? The body of the clavicle, the distal end will be the end furthest away um, from the trunk of the body and that'll attach to the acromion process. And I think that's pretty much it. You have a little um, notch called the scapular notch and there will be different blood vessels and nerves that travel through that scapular notch. So here's another kind of more detailed look um, of the scapula. Drew, thanks for sharing a fracture of your clavicle. Um, the clavicle is one of the most common bones to break, especially in kids. I know you're an adult, but um, in kids, clavicles are common to break because as kids fall and they brace themselves, the clavicle gets a lot of that uh, force. So you, there might be like a minuscule fracture in clavicles, but I'm sorry to hear about your clavicle distal fracture. That sounds really painful. I hope it's healing okay for you. If you want, you can put more detail in the chat for us to read. Um, so here's a look at the scapula, your shoulder blade. We kind of talked about the anterior structures in the previous picture. Here's the superior border and the superior angle is the top point but the posterior structures will be the sides where the spine is. And again, you can feel the spine of your scapula. There will be fossas, which are depressions above and below the spine, the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa. And the glenoid cavity refers to the space where the head of your humerus will sit in that ball and socket joint. Um, you can see here the medial and lateral border. One thing I try to um, ingrained into my students is that the lateral border, again, because it's further away from the midline, will always be on the side where your humerus will attach. So that's the lateral border side. And Larry, you have a clavicle dislocation problem. Wow, so we have clavicle injuries in here. Thanks for sharing, guys. Yikes. So here is the humerus then, the upper arm bone. Here's an anterior view on the left side of your screen and a posterior view on the right side of your screen. Um, you know it's a posterior view because you have the olecranon fossa on the posterior side, and that will be where the um, ulna kind of attaches into the elbow joint. But if we go back up to the top, there's the head of the humerus, 
and then a greater and a lesser bump or tubercle. The greater tubercle is on the lateral side, the lesser tubercle will be on the anterior surface. Um, the anatomical neck surrounds the head and the surgical neck surrounds more of the body part of the humerus a little bit further down. The deltoid tuberosity will be a raised bump about a third of the way down the humerus. And again, that's where your deltoid muscle attaches. And then way at the distal end of the humerus, we have more, we have a medial and a lateral epicondyle. You can feel the epicondyle. It's the prominent bony bump that goes on the inside of your elbow. And then the capitulum and the trochula are just rounded processes at the bottom of the um, humerus. The capitulum is on the lateral end or side and the trochlea is on the medial side. Here's a look at the humerus and the different structures located on the humerus, whether it's the proximal epiphysis, that's the end closest to the ball and socket joint and the distal epiphysis is located further away. Yikes, Drew, that sounds terrible. How did that happen? You can type in the chat if you want to share how you broke it. You must have needed surgery, I'm assuming. Yeah, I can just talk. Yeah, I needed surgery. I, I have a metal plate now. And then so the metal plate that I have right now goes underneath my shoulder blade. And okay. then I have, it, have another surgery to get it taken out because they said if I leave it in, it'll start deteriorating my shoulder. Yikes, what did you do, Drew? How did that happen? <clears throat> yeah, I was skateboarding and just took a bad fall. Oh man. How are you in a lot of pain or is it okay? Um it's been like three months now, so I'm still in, like I still get pain, but it's not too bad. So Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I can't imagine breaking your clavicle in four pieces because it's not that big of a bone so it must have just been obliterated yeah pretty much yikes all right okay well good well keep us when do you get your metal plate out right before my 21st birthday in february so that's okay <laughs> okay oh man thanks for sharing that does not sound fun so moving our way down, and if anyone else wants to share a broken bone story, see, this is what I love about teaching anatomy. There's always some crazy story like that. I once had a football player in my class who like broke his leg during the game and we like watched the reel of it happening. It was really, well, not fun, but it was interesting to see. Anyway, I am sorry to hear that. I'm glad you're okay. Um, if we move on to the forearm, then we have our radius and ulna. And these are the structures on the radius and ulna that you should know. Um, again, the head of the radius is the golf tee-like structure. The ulna also has a head, but that's at the distal end. The styloid processes are just pointed structures at the, their base. Um, the trochlear notch will be the notch in the ulna that will match up with that trochlea, rounded, smooth portion on the humerus. There's a little kind of pointed piece at the base of that trochlear notch called the coronoid process. And the olecranon process is on the posterior side of the ulna, and that will reach up and touch that um, olecranon fossa on the humerus. So everything is kind of named for how they fit together, um, if that helps explain things at all. But the big thing again to remember is that the radius is on the lateral side of the forearm and the ulna will be medial. And when you do that pronation and supination action with your forearm, moving your palms down or your palms facing up, your radius and ulna will actually crisscross each other, um, one over the other. So here are your carpal bones. And um, this is where I have a little acronym to help you remember. There's two rows of carpal bones, four in each. There's a proximal row that's closer to the radius and ulna. So they're kind of this, this back row, and then there's a distal row on top of them. And for how I remember them, <clears throat> I have a clean version and a dirty version. Now you know that my husband's a missionary and I have kids, I'm gonna sh just share the clean version with you. I taught the dirty version when I was still in grad school, but you can Google whatever you want. Um, so the carpal bones, an acronym for remembering them is Sally left, I, I can't even remember. Sally left the party 
to take Kathy home. Um, and if you can remember that saying, Sally left the party, that gives you the first letter in the first proximal row of carpal bones and the distal row to take Kathy home. Um, if that works for you, memorize it. Otherwise, just memorize the, the name of the bones themselves. But they're all just in rows here of two. The scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and pisiform bones are on top of each other. And the pisiform bone looks like the shape of a P. And then trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Uh, the capitate is the largest carpal bone. Kind of hard to tell from this picture, but if we had a model of the hand in front of us, you'd see that the capitate it's kind of like the captain of the ship. It's the largest one. The hamate bone has a little hook on it. Um, but those are the carpal bones, eight of them. You might just have to memorize them. Use whatever um, kind of saying you want to help with that. The metacarpal bones you can't see because they're in the palm of your hand. But the um, phalanges, you can see where you have a proximal, middle, and a distal phalange because your four fingers will bend in three places. The distal will be the tips of your fingers. And the thumb just has a proximal and a distal phalanx or phalange uh, because your thumb only bends in two spots. So that's the hand. Uh, questions about the hand or the bones in the hand? So moving on to the lower extremity, we have our pelvic girdle, which connects um, the lower extremity to the axial skeleton. So that is made up of your hip and your sacrum. And then the lower extremity is shown here with those bones. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that, I just read the chat. You guys can find it. Well, no, don't be searching for that stuff online. That's bad news, but. Um, all right. Then we get to the hip bone. So again, the pelvic bone is combined of these two hip bones. They're also called coxal bones. Um, and they're made up of three bones that are fused together in this location. It's called the acetabulum. And this is where the head of the femur will connect in the ball and socket joint. So the ilium makes up bone. The ischium makes up of the bottom posterior half. That's what you're all sitting on right now. And then the pubis makes up the front half of that lower half of this hip bone. And then within that, there's many structures within each parts of their bones. Um, here, first of all, you see where the sacrum and the coccyx connect. So each hip bone is connected to the sacrum in what we call the sacroiliac joint. Sacro for sacrum and iliac for the ilium bone. The iliac crest travels from your anterior superior iliac spine if you guys feel um, kind of right at your belt line, the ASIS will be that pointed kind of front point on that iliac crest. And the iliac crest will go posterior from that ASIS joint, the ASIS structure. Chiropractors will also um, use the ASIS to kind of um, arrange or what's the word, appropriately rotate your pelvic bone if something is out of whack. They can push on the ASIS um, structures to try to put your pelvic joint back in proper alignment. The iliac fossa is a depression on the ilium bone itself. The obturator foramens are these holes showed here, which you'll have different blood vessels traveling through. The subpubic angle is shown. It's the angle that the two pubis bones make when they come together. And the pubic symphysis or the symphysis pubis is that piece of fibrocartilage that will um, soften and separate out in late pregnancy. So just if you were in lecture, just looking at this pelvis, do you think this is a male or a female pelvis? What do you, what's your guess? You could put it in the chat. Male? Uh, I'm gonna guess male. Male. Yeah. I just think it's male. So there isn't a male pelvis for us to compare it to, um, but just off, for my side of things, it looks more like a female. And I know you've only seen the male one time, um, but the female, the iliac or the ilium bones are much more like wider, wider flared, they say. 
Um, so I would almost call this a female. The male pelvises will be a much narrower in the subpubic angle, and they won't be as wide where these iliac fossas are. But it would be easier if we could compare it right next to the male. Okay, more structures on the hip bone, the iliac crest goes from the ASIS. Again, I've abbreviated that back to the PSIS where you have a posterior superior iliac spine. You have a greater sciatic notch, which is what your sciatic nerve will travel under. It looks like half of a heart. That's how I usually describe it. Um, an ischial spine is this little spinous process on the ischium bone. The ischial tuberosity is a rough edge on the ischium bone. Uh, the acetabulum, again, is the socket part for that ball and socket joint between the femur and the hip bone. Um, and you can see some other structures labeled as well. This is a medial view. So if we were to take your hip bones apart, this is the medial view. So you'll see um, the part called the articular surface, which will articulate or touch with the sacrum to form that sacral iliac joint. That's located right here. Um, you can see the same kind of structures, but just a different view of them. What else? Here's the pelvic brim. It's kind of a bridge or a ridge that's formed. Let's see, I think that's pretty much everything. The iliac fossa is like a little depression within the ilium bone. Uh, but this is a medial view. If you were to take your hip bones apart and look at them from the inside or medial view. More structures of the pelvic bone, anterior, posterior, and lateral side of it. Um, oh, and then again, this describes the difference between the female and the male pelvis. Um, another thing about the male pel pelvis is some of the, like the iliac crest is a little bit more broad and rigid. So it's a little thicker up here in the male um, versus the female has the, um, in general, between male and female skeletons, the male's structures are a little more prominent and thick, whereas the females, they're a little more delicate. So it has a wider um, kind of flare of the ilium bones, but also the iliac crest doesn't look as prominent. Um, you can also see here the pelvic inlet and outlets, which just describe going into and exiting out of the pelvic bones is a lot wider and larger uh, than in the male. So important when you come across the skeleton in the woods, if you ever do, share in class. I've never had a student who that's happened to, but. All right, moving down then, the femur. Um, here's an anterior view of the femur from the front and a posterior view. And um, you can tell if we were in class, I would make all of you guys uh, tell me if you have a right, have a right or a left femur. And you usually can tell by deciding which you need to first figure out what's the front side of it, what's the back side of it, and then which way the head um, is angled. And you can always tell if you have a right or a left femur. Um, so here's the head. The fovea capitis is a little location where you'll have a ligament that will attach the head into the part of the acetabulum on the pelvic bone to help keep it connected. Here's the neck portion. And then on the posterior side, you can see the greater and lesser trochanter, which again are large prominences from the bone. Um, the greater will be more located superiorly. The lesser will be on the medial side. The linea aspera is a nice ridge along the posterior side of the femur. Um, the medial and lateral epicondyles will be on the sides of the distal end, and the medial and lateral condyles will be the rounded portions that will sit right on top of the tibia. Um, the medial condyles and epicondyles will always be on the same side of the head because they're closer to the midline, and the lateral epicondyle and condyles will be on the lateral side of the femur. The patellar surface is where your patella sits. Questions on the femur? So here are the structures. Here is your tibia and fibula. Um, again, the tibia will always be more medially located, so closer to the midline in the body. And that's important because the tibia is much more sturdy than the flimsy fibula. Fibulas are flimsy. And even if we had a model in front of us, you'd see the fibulas are incredibly um, thin. 
They still provide support, uh, but not like the tibia does. So you'll want the fibula on the lateral side of your leg, lower leg, and you want the tibia on the medial side. Um, the tibia has condyles, medial and lateral. You'll notice the lateral condyle will be on the same side as the head of the fibula. Um, and then the medial malleolus is the same side as the medial condyle. And again, the medial and lateral malleolus are describing structures on the tibia and fibula, and they are your lower ankle bones that you can feel right now on your ankle. You'll see, you'll feel little like pointed pieces sticking out on your ankle, and those are the medial and lateral malleolus. Okay, intercondylar eminence is just a little like part that kind of juts up uh, between the condyles, so it's a little piece there and the again the femur condyles will sit nicely on top of the tibia but there will be layers of cartilage uh, so they're not rubbing bone on bone describing the structures we just talked about what happens to the bone when you get shin splints so that occurs in the tibia what a shin splint is i don't i think it's just due to extra stress on the bone itself um, i don't know if they're I need to research what a shin splint is exactly, if it's a teeny tiny fracture or it's just stress on the bone. But usually it's due to stress along the tibia due to constant um, exercise, pounding. Who gets shin splints? Usually runners, people who are putting a lot of pressure on the tibia from all the weight in their body constantly. Anyone know more about shin splints? I don't know, but I know it hurts. <laughs> painful, yeah, they are painful. Good question. They, they just tell you drink water. Drink water. That's like the that's what everyone tells you when something's wrong. But it's good because water usually helps. But yeah, yeah. I'll, let me. I'm curious about that. I'm gonna look into that after this. Then the tarsal bones of the foot. I don't have any fun, dirty or clean acronyms for the tarsal bones. But the tarsal bones are a lot easier. Uh, because there aren't as many of them. The talus will connect to the tibia bone, which is right above that. The calcaneus is a heel bone, so the calcaneus is just your heel. The cuboid is on the lateral side of the foot, kind of shaped like a cube. And then the navicular spans all three cuneiform bones, your medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bone. All will line up with the navicular. Metatarsals are in the sole of the foot, and then the same thing goes with phalanges in your toes. The big toe only has a proximal and distal phalange, whereas your other four digits toes have proximal middles and distal because they can bend in four places. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop the power or the recording. <laughs>